The 18th and 19th centuries in Europe and America were an age of radical change in society, thought, and politics. These changes were perhaps most transformative in England, France, and the United States, but the impact was felt really across the world. Um, transformations of this era were rooted in the scientific revolution, which began in the Renaissance era and ultimately resulted in an age of enlightenment in the 18th and early 19th centuries. The Enlightenment was an intellectual and philosophical movement marked by the strong belief that humans should be reasonable, rational beings who base their knowledge on empirical observation, rational evaluation, and logical consideration of math and sciences, rather than being superstitious creatures that are ruled by gods or the aristocracy. Um, the Enlightenment argued for equal rights and opportunities for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so both the American Revolution of 16, or excuse me, of 1776 and the French Revolution in 1789 were based in Enlightenment thought. The transformations of the 18th century were also put into motion by the Industrial Revolution, a period of rapid technological and mechanical development from about 1760 to 1840 that really resulted in the rise of capitalist financial power and the mass production and consumption of goods. Think the development of steam power, railroads, machinery, and factories, all of which resulted in increased urbanization, a growing middle class, but also pollution and overcrowded and sort of unsanitary living conditions and unsafe and unregulated working conditions and much more. While royal, religious, and aristocratic patronage was still an important means of artistic success in the 18th and 19th centuries, we'll also see a shift towards art being produced as sort of a commodity to be sold to industrial, merchant, and middle-class patrons as well. So in about 1715, the French Duc d'Orléans, the regent for the 15-year-old King Louis XV, he moved the French court back to Paris and brought with it the extravagantly opulent court culture of Versailles. So this, in combination with the rise in commercialism and the Enlightenment thought, um, really led to the development of a new, refined, fanciful style of art and architecture, which we now label the Rococo. The term Rococo references the Italian word Barocco, which again describes an irregularly shaped pearl and is the word that inspired the label Baroque. Um, and it's also taken from the French word rocaille, which is a sort of popular form of garden and interior decoration that used shells and pebbles. Um, now in the 18th century, this would have simply been called le goût moderne or the modern taste. Um, but with the French court returned to Paris, aristocratic social life flourished. Socialites thought um, artists should be able to embody their celebration of witty exchanges, intellectual and cultural tastes, elegance and luxury, especially in the name of leisure, pleasure, frivolity, and sensuality. Rococo maintains a rather Baroque emphasis on exuberant, exuberant naturalism, dynamic forms, and sensuous surfaces, and some really argue that the style is just sort of a late Baroque, um, but the Rococo tends to go even further and it becomes something totally new. Uh, generally, the Rococo style is more refined and fanciful than the Baroque. It tends to be lighter and more playful, and if possible, even more decorative and extravagant to the point of being frivolous. The Rococo is definitely an art of the privileged, but it does promote enlightenment ideals and values that have had major impacts on the modern world. French courtiers built elegant Parisian townhomes with large rooms dedicated to social functions. The term salon refers to these rooms themselves, as well as the events that took place within them, which were really these intimate, fashionable, and intellectual social gatherings, usually held weekly in the style of court gatherings at Versailles. These salons are the epitome of the Rococo style, with very heavily ornamented walls and ceilings and lavish furnishings. Um, so here we have the Salon des Princesses at the Hotel de Subie. 
which was designed by the architect Germain Beaufrand, and it was used by French aristocrats for several years before the revolution. This is a typical style of French Rococo salon design in the 1730s. It's a relatively small oval room, and the walls and ceilings are heavily decorated with sculpted stucco architectural elements like arabesques, which are these sort of forms with flowing lines and sort of swirling shapes. Um, there are also S and C shapes, uh, scrolling volutes and plant-like forms. Um, and so all of the decoration here is very much inspired by Versailles. Here's another angle so you can see a bit more of the room. Um, you can see we have the repetition of these huge arched windows and these large mirrors which reflect the natural light and in combination with the glittering gold and silver against the white and pastel blue walls and ceiling, it makes the room seem both luxurious and spacious. There's a certain sense of delicacy and lightness here, but also a substantial emphasis on opulent surfaces. And then the salon would have been further decorated with luxurious paintings and sculptures, which would add a visual narrative to the room and really enhance the already opulent atmosphere. So in France, the Rococo style typically was used in secular spaces because of its expression of intimacy, pleasure, sociability, and sensuality. However, in Catholic Central Europe, it was also a religious style, reflecting the extended interest of using the arts to create dramatic, spiritually effective spaces, a tradition which was established during the Catholic Reformation with the Baroque style. One of the most opulent Rococo churches was built in Bavaria between about 1743 and 1772 by the German arch architect Johann Balthasar Neumann. The church of Wiersenhelligen is dedicated to the Wiersenhelligen, or the 14 auxiliary saints or holy helpers. These were 14 medieval Catholic saints who helped heal the sick during the Black Plague. And so Neumann's interior plan here is really based on a series of six overlapping ovals surrounding this vaulted ovoid center. And as you can see, we have this altar of the Viersen Heligen um, kind of right in the central part of the sanctuary space. We've got these clusters of pilasters and engaged marble columns that alternate with two levels of arched openings to the sides. Um, they kind of open to the side aisles and to balconies. Um, we have to have these large windows that really illuminate the undulating white and gold surfaces here and reveal this repetition of flowing and swirling arabesque shapes throughout the interior, um, sort of overlaying the walls and the ceilings, and then again repeated in the rather fanciful capitals of these columns and pilasters here. The overall effect is one of both extravagance and delicacy, and it results in this sort of airy and light yet lively and inspiring space um, dedicated to spiritual devotion. French Rococo paintings typically revolve around themes of sociability, leisure, sensuality, playfulness, and luxury, though often the narratives and meanings are somewhat ambiguous. Subjects included modern aristocratic people doing modern aristocratic things, as well as subjects from classical mythology, especially love stories. Um, images often include playful putti or Cupid-like figures, as we can see here. Um, and we'll also see lots of lush foliage and kind of fluffy clouds. Formally, we'll see the continued use of diagonals and asymmetry as within the Baroque, but we'll also see more fluid flowing lines, softer colors, and more delicate kind of painterly brushwork. Jean-Antoine Watteau is sometimes seen as the originator or maybe the greatest practitioner of French Rococo painting. He arrived in Paris in about 1702, where he studied works in both public and private collections by artists like Rubens, Georgion, and Titian. Watteau really embodies the spirit and characteristics of Rococo with his fluid lines, his loose brushwork, his soft yet lush colors, and these small, fashionable figures. This work from 1717, titled Pilgrimage to Cythera, is perhaps his best known work, and it's a perfect example of the Rococo emphasis on aristocratic leisure, though there's also sort of a melancholy undertone that really reminds the viewer of the transience of beauty and pleasure. 
So Watteau has depicted this idyllic, aristocratic outing to the Greek island of Scythera, the sacred birthplace of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. Notice the sort of loose feathery brushwork um, that really creates these fluffy trees and then the gentle kind of curve of the hillside, but it also sort of implies the sense of spontaneous motion among our figures. Watteau submitted this work to fulfill a requirement for his admission to the French Royal Academy in 1717. While it didn't fit into any of the existing categories within the Academy's hierarchy of genres, they were so impressed by it that they created a new category called the Fête Galant, which means an elegant outdoor party. Um, and they used this to describe scenes in which, um, you know, aristocrats are depictor, depicted having sort of a leisurely, um, entertaining time. Um, and it's often in an outdoor kind of setting. The Fête Galant was really intended for elite, privileged audiences, and it reflects those worldviews, values, and manners, which means that there is a certain level of ambiguity in the narrative a lot of the time. For example, here in Watteau's Pilgrimage to Scythera, um, the narrative is somewhat ambiguous. Are these people about to depart for the island of Scythera, or are they already there and kind of finishing up this day of romantic trysts and getting ready to go back home? Um, over here to the far right of the composition, we have this statue of Venus that's been wrapped in roses, and then this little putti figure who is seated on the ground before her. Um, and then over to the opposite side, to the left of the composition, we have this gilded kind of boat with this Cupid-like oarsman, and again, these little smaller putti figures flying above. And so all these things really sort of imply that we're already on the island of Scythera. But if you notice, these putti that fly above, this one holds this little torch kind of directly above um, the silhouette of this uh, kind of rocky outcropping, maybe even a city in the distance. And so some scholars argue that that is meant to be the island of Scythera kind of um, far away. The landscape here has been populated with these fashionably dressed aristocratic couples that are kind of frozen in elegant refined motion and they form this sort of flowing um, line from one side of the composition to the other. So is this an arrival or a departure for um, Scythera? Um, we've sort of got, <clears throat> we've got this seated couple kind of here to the right next to Venus and Cupid, and they seem to be sort of quietly flirting. The woman is kind of blushing and the man is sort of pointing over to the forest there. Um, and then next to them, we have two more couples. One man is helping his partner stand up and then this other man is kind of, um, ushering his partner down the hill towards several other groups who kind of embrace along the shoreline and seem to be kind of heading towards the boat. Um, some scholars argue that the seated woman to the right seems sort of coy, even maybe a little standoffish, um, but then as we kind of progress toward the shoreline and, and toward the boat, we have women that sort of willingly take the arms of their suitors and we see um, kind of a more willing intimacy or kind of level of interaction um, and then you know some point out that there seems to be kind of a sharper more crisp handling of paint on the right and then a looser kind of application on the left resulting in these hazier forms which potentially signifies like this progression from clarity to disillusion from reason to emotion or maybe from the real to the realm of the mythical here. Um, but again, Watteau's Fête Galant really demonstrates this kind of dreamy, idyllic, yet sort of wistful and melancholic vision of aristocratic leisure, as well as this very human interest in romance and sexuality. Watteau sold his works to new urban aristocrats through art dealers in the city. This work was painted for the dealer Edim Francois Gerson uh, to serve as the signboard for his shop, but it was actually so well received that the work sold in less than a month. Um, so here Watteau has created somewhat of a fête galant, but in an entirely modern kind of urban space of this retail art shop and gallery. 
Watteau depicts the interior that is filled with um, paintings from the Venetian and Netherlandish schools, which he greatly admired. Um, and we have these elegant kind of aristocratic visitors that seem to be at ease within their surroundings, kind of seeking to purchase things that will demonstrate their wealth, their status, and their interests in art, culture, and commercialism. Um, to the left, we have this woman wearing a rather fashionable pink dress who steps across the threshold into the shop, um, and she sort of ignores the man to her right who offers his hand. Um, and she's really kind of watching these workers who are packing away this mirror, along with this portrait of King Louis XIV. Now, this is potentially a reference to Gersant's shop's name, which was Au Grand Monarch, um, but it also kind of reminds the viewer of the passage of time and the transience of life. Um, this was painted in 1721, and King Louis XIV had died about six years earlier, so by this point, he was sort of this old, irrelevant cultural figure, and so the woman and the gentleman here move past him to enter into the realm of this modern kind of elegant space. On the clock that is kind of in the background directly above the king's portrait, um, we see on the top these allegorical figures of fame, and then inside a figure, or excuse me, a pair of figures that are meant to be lovers. Um, so the clock itself serves as sort of a memento mori or a reminder of mortality and transience that kind of suggests that both love and fame or trends are fleeting. Um, and then to the right of the scene, we have these other figures who are very preoccupied with other items and themselves. Um, some of them admire these rather erotic mythological paintings, while others um, in this little group at the counter kind of stare into this mirror that's being shown by the shop worker. And so all of this really furthers the underlying Venetus theme um, as these serve as like symbols of the fragility of life, of wealth, and of pleasure. Um, and so Watteau made this painting during the final days of his life before he died of tuberculosis at the age of 40. And according to Gerson, Watteau completed this in about eight days while only working during the mornings because of his poor health. So the most prominent Rococo painter in France after Watteau's death would have been Francois Boucher. He was the son of a painter, and in 1723 he began working in an engraving shop, reproducing Watteau's paintings for a collector. He studied at the French Academy in Rome from 1727 to 31, and then returned to Paris where he became very close friends with Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Madame Pompadour was an artist herself, and she took printmaking lessons from Boucher, but she also became a major supporter and patron of his and really helped him to gain other royal commissions. Um, so in about 1751, Pompadour commissioned Boucher for this work on the right, which is titled The Toilette of Venice, um, and she used it to decorate her dressing room at Bellevue, which was her chateau um, kind of just on the outskirts of Paris uh, that the king had paid for. Um, and so this is a portrait of Madame de Pompadour. As you can see, the resemblance is, you know, undeniable um, from this depiction of her and this depiction of her. Um, but this time, Boucher has kind of, you know, depicted her in the guise of the goddess Venus. She's seated kind of on this carved, gilded, and velvet upholstered sofa, while these little pooty figures and doves kind of help to fix her hair and choose her jewelry from these piles of plush fabrics and luxury goods. Um, so this is her getting ready for her day, essentially. Um, you can really see the kind of loose brushwork that he uses really maybe best on these billowing curtains that part to reveal this formal kind of garden-like space. And so Boucher here is very much kind of emphasizing and reveling in the luxurious details without incorporating any sort of moralizing or religious symbolism. In 1765, Boucher became the first painter to King Louis XV, and for him, he painted a variety of subjects, including royal portraits, mythological narratives, and scenes of daily court life, as well as more erotic works for private enjoyment, like this portrait of a then-teenaged Louise O'Murphy, who would soon become another of the king's mistresses. Um, she's shown here completely nude and kind of provocatively laid out on this daybed, seemingly totally unaware of her viewer. Um, 
notice how Boucher has really sort of emphasized the kind of satiny um, bedding and clothing that are being crumpled under her body and then her legs kind of sink into the pillow here. Um, he's really using kind of you know light and shadow to kind of model the pillow and suggest volume and three-dimensionality but also to suggest kind of this soft plush texture as well. Um, Louise's rear end is really right at the center of the composition here, um, really ensuring that the viewer understands the very purposeful sensuality of this subject. And so this is interesting because this is not a mythological vision, but rather a believable and kind of even recognizable um, human woman with a very contemporary personality situated with this, um, you know, kind of realistic and again, contemporary Rococo space. So one more prominent French Rococo painter was Jean-Honor Fragonard, who studied with Boucher at the French Royal Academy. In 1752, Fragonard won the Prix de Rome, a three to five year scholarship given to top graduating students from the French Royal Academy. And then he spent 1756 to 61 in Italy before becoming a full member of the Academy in 1765. Um, Fragonard typically catered to aristocratic clientele, especially after Boucher's death, um, which was in 1770. This work is from 1767, and it's titled The Swing, and it's probably his most famous work. It really sort of epitomizes Rococo painting. Um, now, this was originally commissioned from another painter, Gabriel Francois Doyen, but he thought that the subject was too sort of sensually explicit, and so he passed it on to Fragonard. And so here we have a sort of small fête galant scene with this young aristocratic woman wearing a rather fashionable kind of pink poofy dress. Um, and she's enjoying this leisurely afternoon surrounded by the lush foliage of this garden space. She sort of gracefully flies through the air on this golden swing with its red velvet cushion. And she's being moved by her elderly guardian who's back here in the shadows kind of pulling on these ropes. Um, she strikes this rather elegant yet flirty kind of coy pose. She kicks up one leg playfully and kind of tosses her shoe towards her secret lover who is hiding down here in the bushes. Um, so she's sort of rejecting the traditional constraints of female modesty with her action and she's giving him this rather unobstructed view of her skirt. Um, he kind of playfully reaches forward as if he's going to block his own view and then she's gazing at him rather seductively and he sort of leans back on on this tall pedestal that supports this sculpture of Cupid, which is making this sort of shushing gesture to assure the couple that he is not going to spill their secret. Um, we've got this very sort of strong diagonal composition like we saw with the Baroque, but now it's been rendered with a sort of loose, airy brushstroke that forms this fluffy foliage kind of surrounding the sweet yet sensual scene of aristocratic pleasure and desire. And it's all been infused with this sense of light, kind of playful humor as well. And so this was really the kind of thing that Fragonard's clients loved. Relatively small works, this is really only about 31 by maybe 25 inches here. And so these would have been intended for display in intimate rooms called cabinets, where patrons um, and his, their sort of entourages could appreciate these depictions of the subversions of societal norms in the pursuit of kind of personal pleasure and happiness.